are are you guys at? Um, I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan. And how's the weather in Ann Arbor? Um, recently, I mean, it, it stopped snowing a few days ago, and then it just snowed all over again. It, the roads have been terrible, but and most importantly, the potholes are terrible. So it's incredibly hard to drive. But other than that, not bad. Yeah, makes sense to me. Oh, there we go. I muted myself too. Cool. Well, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'll introduce everybody and what we're going to get started. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks for coming to Repair Radio. This is uh, episode three, and we uh, get together every other Thursday at 11 a.m. PST to talk about the right to repair movement and a lot of other cool repair stuff that's kind of evolving. It's the wild really and crazy cool. world of people fixing things. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's just amazing the diversity of, you know, kind of interests that we've gotten, people from all over the world, all walks of life that are brought together by their desire to uh, defeat the second law of thermodynamics. <laughs> Everything breaks. <laughs> <laughs> Everything, yeah, breaks Everything breaks eventually. And if it weren't for us caretakers, uh, you know, attempting, <laughs> struggling valiantly to, to push back the forces of chaos, yeah. uh, we would be, <laughs> Way. the force of entropy would, would wash over the world and, yeah. and devolve everything into a state of dysfunction. Yeah. And I think a lot of people could say like, oh, back in my day, you know, we used to just fix things when they're broken. And uh, this podcast is here to inform people about the right to repair movement, how to get, you know, hopefully laws passed in more states in the U.S. But then also, yeah, just focus on featuring people fixing things because um, we're all capable of um, fixing um, the things that we bought, especially when it comes to like cell phone repairs and laptop upgrades. So um, we're live streaming from our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash I fix it yourself. And then we'll also post this audio to all the podcast apps tomorrow. So if you don't get a chance to hang out with us today, you can definitely listen in there. Um, so for those that don't know, Right to Repair is um, a movement um, that's trying to get a set of laws passed in the states that'll help us fix our stuff. What what kinds of things can you give us just like a summary of what they what it'll require and fill people in before we? Yeah. So the go question on? is, how do we bring balance back to the universe? How do we get back to a place where we can fix all of our things? And as we have add electronics into everything, you know, a microcontroller can be as little as twenty five cents nowadays, and that's why you'll have greeting cards with <laughs> that will play you happy birthday. So that's actually got a microcontroller in it. The world of adding software and electronics to all of our products is handing manufacturers the opportunity to either monopolize or flat out just shut out repair. Yeah. And sort of the right to repair laws are a framework that is designed to bring balance back into the universe, make it so that everybody else can fix things. Yeah. And we're not reinventing the wheel here. We actually have laws on the books. We've talked oh. about this in the past. In Massachusetts in 2012 passed the first other right to repair law. It's been very successful at making sure that independent mechanics can compete, yeah. uh, can continue to fix the same kind of new vehicles as the dealerships. Even uh, some design changes starting in the 2018 model year cars were mandated as a result of, of that bill. So the, the right to repair laws that are being discussed all over the world, and it's not just yeah. in the U.S. now, so US now since our last episode, Canada, Canada introduced. introduced a bill. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the Ontario Parliament, Michael Coteau introduced a bill, which is really exciting, and he's yeah. gotten a lot of, of uh, international press around it. Yeah, I know. We've been working with CNBC a bit to do, you know, special features on like where um, your smartphone like materials come from and, um, you know, how these things are made and then how they're disposed of and repaired and you know dealt with at the end of their life. So really cool. Just excited to have Right to Repair in Canada because people are always asking us as on the podcast, like, OK, this is for U.S. states, but how do I get involved if I'm not in the U.S.? Because Europe's taken strides far ahead of us and they have a lot more um, kind of focus and irons in the fire with right to repair, but now Canada's on too, which is which is awesome. Um, and I think the here in the states, you know, to get laws passed in individual states, we just need a lot of grassroots movement, grassroots movement, and people on like boots on the ground and featuring these fixers, so we can start saying, hey, manufacturers, like if you make parts and information available, um, we can fix our own things, or we at least need these resources available to people so they have more options. So you you know, you're not stuck taking your car into the uh, the dealership to get an oil change, and it's similar for your phone. So I, I feel like that's kind of why we always make that, that comparison. But so um, to kind of show more people fixing things, we came up with the I'm a Genius campaign. So for the last two weeks, we've asked people to submit their repair stories and um, just share, yes. tell us the kind of things that you're fixing and post yeah. a, a story. I, I feel like, I mean, there's some element of 
uh, you know, infantilization of society where, where the manufacturers and the Apple genius is saying, I'm holier than thou, I'm yeah. smarter than you. Uh, we're the only ones that know how to do this. When we are testifying in, on uh, right to repair legislation in the states, one of the things manufacturers constantly bring up is we're the only ones that know how to do this safely. If anyone else does this, they're going to hurt themselves. Yeah, constantly being told that we're not capable or don't have the skills or that it's too dangerous when, you know, on the call today, we have two <laughs> two people under the age of 18 that are running their own repair businesses. Right, and, and, and that really was well. why we wanted to invite these guys. So uh, I'm, we're super impressed uh, by the kind of breadth of expertise in our community from all over the place. And, and two people that we've been most impressed by are joining us here on the call today. Yeah. Uh, so we have Surya yeah. on the call from Michigan. Hey, Surya. <laughs> and so Surya, uh, tell us how old you are and maybe how old you were when you started fixing things. Yeah, yeah. so I'm, I'm 18 now. I turned 18 in January. Um, I've been fixing things um, almost forever. My, my first kind of memory of me fixing things was with a small RC car in second grade, uh, one of my neighbors ran over it with a bike, so I had to had to find a way to solder the tiny wires back. But my dad helped me with that. Um, I started fixing phones in ninth grade, um, eighth and ninth grade, and I realized with all the tutorials, all the advice, and all the YouTube videos online that anyone could fix their own a phone. So after that, I decided that I need to cater my business towards high school students because. Let's be honest, they're kind of broke and they don't want to get <laughs> Apple all the time. So I thought I could find an find, um, unmet need there and yeah. it kind of quickly got support and it spread with word of mouth. So I remember hearing that your mom came in and found like a wad of hundred dollar bills that you had earned from swapping screens and yeah. stuff. What was what so was that conversation yeah, like? Was this like <laughs> when did you start dealing drugs? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a funny story about that. I actually had a shirt called Got Cracks on it. What sometimes the S folded over, so it's got <laughs> and, um. <laughs> that combined with the wad of hundred dollar bills was like no. But my my mom, uh, she she was supportive, um, but made sure that I was allocating time towards my schoolwork. And yeah. also to my business on the side. So well, uh, we really, time management is something I've learned a lot from this. Definitely. Well, we appreciate you guys taking the time out of school and stuff to be here. And congratulations on turning 18. Happy belated birthday. Big deal. Um, but yeah, no, that's just, it's incredible to see how you guys just start f fixing one thing. And that was one thing with the I'm a Genius campaign. People were saying, I opened up one phone. And for me, it was very similar. And I fixed it, I opened up one phone, and was like, oh, okay, well, now I can open cameras and laptops and things just aren't so scary. So that RC car kind of, you know, was pivotal to, you know, the it rest was of the your, gateway drug. The gateway drug, the gateway, <laughs> the gateway repair, the gateway <laughs> break. That's so, that's too funny. Um, Moses and his dad Mark are also here and have somewhat of a similar story with you know starting a repair, repair business. Yeah, tell us about um, Moses. Tell us about maybe your first couple of fixes and how you decided to start your repair business and fixing things. Yo, well, first of all, Moses, how old are you? Oh yeah. So I'm 15, and um, I did my first repair in 2016. So I think I was 13 at that time, something like that. And it was a 2008 MacBook. Um, it had a cracked screen and I got it for free from one of my dad's coworkers. And so yeah, that really started it all. That's a pretty advanced first repair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then I um, fixed my sister's iPod touch for later both pretty hard repairs. Yeah, that's not an easy <laughs> repair either. So so tell me, as you're, as you're going through the process with this MacBook, you've got it, you know, the screen's broken, so you need to open it up somehow. What was your thought process? Um, well, I've always like liked Apple products and it was free. So I was like, worse can go wrong. Like nothing really can go wrong other than breaking it. And I don't, I don't lose anything. Right. So yeah, yeah. it's already that's, broken. <laughs> a lot of people say, I don't want to make start. it worse. And it's like, but it's not functioning right now. So, you know, if you don't do anything, then it's really just sitting there. So sure. And so, uh, uh, how did you, how did you learn how to take apart? I mean, you know, Apple's the most technologically advanced company on the planet. You're taking apart their computer. How did you get the confidence to, to open it up? So I just went to your website. I think I had heard of it before and Earlier that year, I had gotten some free water damage phones, and so I like I had looked you up then for like guides, but I didn't have any parts or tools to fix them. But so when I got the MacBook, I bought a Protect toolkit and then just followed your guides, and it was pretty easy. 
So you're getting all of these, where are you getting all these devices from? You start slowly start collecting. I see this with a lot of the fixer. Well, I would say most fixers are like low key hoarders sometimes where like you just start getting all of these projects that start sitting like, I'll fix it one day, I'll fix it one day. But where'd you get all, all of those um, devices from all the, you know. Bro so I got the um, water damage ones from kids at school cause they like eighth graders, middle schoolers, they break phones all the time. Uh, just tons of them. And then the MacBook I got from his work, one of his coworkers. So the word starts to get out. I remember so when, when I was in high school, I kind of had the reputation at the school with all the teachers that I was the guy to come to when they had computer problems. Have you ever been pulled out of class by another teacher to go and fix their computer? Not out of class because we're in a fairly big school. So we have like an IT department. Okay. But I know like back in elementary school, I would help the teachers out. You'd help the teachers. So I see Surya nodding his head. <laughs> Surya, what's your experience? <laughs> Um, well, <laughs> so mine was in about ninth grade. Um, most of the teachers, sometimes they can't figure out to turn the projector on. And at the time, I had a Samsung Galaxy S5 with the IR blaster on it. So I felt super cool like, turning the projector on with the phone. But um, <laughs> other than that, um, me and another friend, we kind of help around the school with like, the, the Wi-Fi and the teachers who have problems connecting to it. But yeah, we're kind of like the, the pseudo IT department. That's awesome. Do you, um, how do you help others get started with repair? Like, um, do you, it just seems like it's kind of this empowering thing. Like you get to be the one to kind of help people fix the problems that they, um, that they can't, um, that they can't fix. And so do you help other people fix things? And what do you see when, um, uh, what do you see when you're, um, working with other people and that, like that aha moment? Right. So, um, after around my fifth or sixth repair, I wanted to kind of help people repair their own phones because I don't want to like, just do it all myself. And I want to I want to have people learn about their devices. So um, one of my neighbors actually came over and um, uh, he, I'd say his family is comfortable. So they kind of they can buy new phones, they can buy parts for that like, uh, pretty, pretty uh, frequently. So he had an iPhone, iPhone 6S and um, I told them like, here are the parts, here are the tools, and here's a guide. And he was pretty scared at first because he didn't want to break the phone. Um, but after after he kind of slowly followed the steps, um, checked his progress, um, I, I think anyone could do it. His 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 first repair was fine, and right now he's helping more friends fix their phones. So I think it's getting over that first hurdle of, okay, um, I have a lot of resources at my hand. If I just take time, take patience. Uh, go step by step, keep your parts in order. I think anyone can do any type of repair. Yeah, and I feel like it's like putting together a piece of IKEA furniture, but with better instructions. Like <laughs> it's it's you know if you stay organized, it, yeah. sometimes it, you know it's process, but the resources are there. Moses, how about you? Have you helped anybody else um, kind of learn repair and seen that kind of trickle down effect of everybody fixing things? I mean, I haven't like helped like do smartphone repair, but I've definitely helped other people like take apart things just for fun that were like already broken and stuff like that. Yeah, teardowns, teardowns are pretty cool. <laughs> I, have, I have to say so myself. But um, so you both have like, but you've taken this kind of next step with uh, like getting involved with Right to Repair. And I know that you've both written in to your state reps. And one thing that we do on the call is we, you know, tell people, hey, like just write a letter, write a phone call, like meet with your state reps. So Moses, what was it like um, writing that letter to your state legislator? Because I read over it and it was awesome. Um, but did you find it easy, difficult? Like what, what are tips for some other people that are gonna um, write into their state reps about right to repair? I thought it was pretty easy. Um, he never ended up responding, so I don't know why, but um, yeah, I thought it was pretty easy. Just like explained what it was about. Um, on repair.org, they have like pretty good explanation of what it's about. So I just kind of followed that. Cool. And you did an awesome job with just sharing your story. And I think that that's what a lot of these, you know, state reps need to hear, right? It's just, it, it's like strength in numbers. The more stories and things yeah. that they get from people, the more it's like, oh, this is an issue that you right. know, we need to really push forward. There, yeah. there was a, there was a viral video this last week where a bunch of uh, kids from a California school were talking to Diane Feinstein about the Green New Deal and saying, hey, what about us? What about like climate change is going to impact us? Why don't, why don't you do something about us? And she was so dismissive. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but but I don't. I, I, that's not the experience that we've gotten uh, from state reps w- with right to repair. I don't, I don't think. Yeah, and I think the same thing applies for e-waste. I mean, we could have the same a similar group of kids standing in front of people right. saying, "Hey, if we don't do something now, it's going to turn into a, a Wally world of trash and the things." That's kind of like where we're headed. Surya, you you wrote to your state reps and you got a reply. I think did um, did she call you? What was that reply like? And um, yeah, fill us in on that. Um, so. Uh, I wrote it uh, after looking at repair.org as Moses was saying, they have great resources on how to format your, how to format your letters and everything. So I, I just, at that point, I can't remember the exact timeline, but this is like iPhone eight stuff, iPhone six touch disease, can't remember, around that timeline. But I said, if, if companies can just tamper with their electronic, not tamper, if t- companies can remotely brick your phone or brick your phone with software that the repairs don't know about, was stopping them from doing any other things. So I decided to write a letter and my letter was basically trying to sell my story. So I think the important thing to, um, when you're writing to state legislators and state senators, you have to make sure you sell, sell a story, sell an idea and show how it can help a lot, help everyone. So if you, if you write just a story about how it saved yourself or how it made your company, made your business better, it's not gonna do as well as this is what right to repair is. This is how it can help everyone. This is how it can get jobs. This is how it can increase competition. So I think make sure you're making sure to sell that idea of right to repair. That's great advice. Uh, so what response did you get from from your letter? So it, around four weeks, I was actually in India at the time, but I did get an email from her from um, the state center uh, secretary, and. After that, she told me to come down to an office that she had in Ann Arbor. Oh, cool. So oh, I awesome. ended up uh, speaking with her for around an hour or so on what right to repair is and kind of the next steps we can do. And so you get invited by the senator to come into her office. What does that feel like? It's definitely super cool. Like, um, especially for a high school student, I think we think everyone in government is like super high up. They don't want to like, talk to us. But at the end of the day, these people work for us. They are our state legislators. Them. Their job is to listen to their constituents, and what I did was kind of exercising what, what small power I had to talk to my state representative. So definitely, it's super cool, and I would encourage a lot of people to write to their own state representative. So, what kind of questions? Like, describe like you walk into the office and describe what it was like. <laughs> like walk us through your your kind of emotional journey here. Well, first part was kind of weird because I opened the door and it was locked. So um, I was like standing there for around 15, not 15, like 10, 15 minutes until someone like noticed a kid outside the door. Um, <laughs> but after that, um, this lady, the like, really fancy lady with like these really fancy suits and everything, told me like to sit down and I just waited. And then, but she had like a nice small conference room and she, she was like another human being. It's some, some high executive. And so, so, bed. so then the senator comes in and what, what was the, what was her, her first question for you? Um, oof. I think or just like g- g- give us a bit of how the conversation went. Um, well, the conversation was definitely uh, very positive. She she kind of was familiar with the right to repair, not um, like the, the auto right to repair. So she was familiar with how uh, mechanics were able to fix other cars, get parts from dealerships, get parts from other car companies, and she was inquiring about the situation with electronics. So I think. She educated me on on the legislative end, and I had educated her on like the electronics end. So it was um, we, I, I learned a lot, and she learned a lot, and um, it was a very very productive conversation. That's great. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, that's exactly the kind of thing that you want from electric representatives. Right? Yeah, and you and you want to have that back and forth because you know going back to like the repair stories, this applies to more than just phones and tablets. And I think that when we're talking about right to repair, we focus on that tech that a lot of people are uncomfortable with. So if you can educate them better on the electronics aspect and get them to realize that it's more than just phones and laptops that need you know right to repair, that that's huge and that opportunity is huge. And so Moses, we gotta. Maybe ping your your rep on um, Twitter and <laughs> <laughs> see if we can get you. A hey. Yeah, <laughs> nice. So um, Moses, like, if right to repair passes, I know you know you haven't had a conversation with your state reps yet, but if right to repair passes, um, I guess what are you most excited about with right to repair passing? Um, or if you know, if and when, like, what does this world look like <laughs> to you when it passes? I think it'd be nice to have like access to the tools to fix like Touch ID and Face ID 
because that's a big problem. And I know I just had a mistake with that. <laughs> <laughs> But like, it's because the, yeah, the resources aren't out there. And that's why, you know, we do these teardowns and things to take them apart. So people yeah. have a first look and like a sneak peek into like what you're getting into before you, yeah, if you start sure. fixing things. So if you don't mind, Moses, and I think this is, this is, you know, all of us make mistakes. Would you mind walking us through your touch ID mistake? <laughs> uh, yeah. So I was taking the, I took the screen off and I was removing the home button on a seven and I tried to get a spudger under it. And I just slipped a little, and the yeah. cable yeah. so fragile that it just split. It's yeah. a super fragile cable. Oh, wow. uh, and and that's just so devastating because it's the one thing that you can't fix without Apple's fancy machine. Yep. So what did you end up doing with the phone? Um. So I found a micro soldering shop in New York, and I sent it to that. Fantastic. Yeah, so, so just to loop everybody in that isn't familiar with this particular problem, the Touch ID sensor on the iPhone is cryptographically tied to the main uh, board. And when Apple programs the, the phones at the factory, they pair the, the home button with the, with the main uh, circuit board. If you do a repair later, if the home button fails, there's nothing you can do. Um, but if you're opening it and you accidentally damage that cable, you're stuck because now the, the fingerprint sensor won't work. Mm -hmm. And so either you have to fix the particular home button that you have or you're out of luck. Uh, and, and so your approach, I think, is a great one, which is to actually find a way to fix the individual cable, which requires probably equipment that is a little bit higher end than you can afford right now. But maybe that's something that, that you can work up to. <laughs> yeah. Microsoft. That's that's my goal. I got a microscope, but now I'm working up to saving for a soldering iron. Nice. Fantastic. And have you been watching uh, the videos? We had Lewis Rossman on uh, last last episode. Have you watched some of Lewis's videos? Oh. You're muted. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I've watched both Lewis and Jessa. Cool. So who would you say, you know, as you guys are are you kind of looking up to the the people who are repair professionals out there, who do you look up to? Who are your heroes? And I'll, I'll ask this to both of you, but we'll start with Moses. Um, so like I said, Lewis and Jessa, they're both like great at micro soldering and like yeah. And then also um Federico Serva, I think is how you pronounce him, his name. He's in the UK and he also does micro soldering. And so, yeah, probably those. Awesome. Yeah. So I was Sorry, who do, you, who do you kind of look up to? Um, so a quick story on how I, I kind of came to know about iFixit. I was probably, I thought it was like Linus Tech Tips like a few years ago, and I saw his like embroidered toolkit. Just, anyway, <laughs> um, so Linus is great. I've actually been very interested in kind of the scope outside phones and tablets. So I've been watching a lot of car rebuilders so um people like bees for build uh, Tavarish. I, li I like those guys a lot i think um, looking at how the car dealers and how the, the companies sell their parts is definitely very inspiring and something right to repair it's some other, something other companies can look forward to um i've definitely seen i've seen lots of lewis's videos um i i, I also watch all of rich rebuilds tesla videos so i think i've been trying to diversify what can be repaired um people's kind of niche skills at repairing things right just definitely rich has a great channel yeah. uh he he buys these completely busted like salvage teslas that have been in you know water damage or something pulls them apart and builds new cars out of them and he says teslas are really repairable i i think he says tesla built a lego car <laughs> it's really easy to work on uh but there's no documentation or there hasn't been documentation until recently but there's got to be somebody to start. I feel like you started back in the day with right. certain guides and he's starting with those too. And that's because it's like, yeah, there are so many resources out there, but it's a matter of like to fix your thing, you need a whole set of resources because you need parts, tools, and, you know, schematics or guides or something. Right. So, um, and that's, you know, right to repair. I think we'll kind of bring everything together. And I think we were talking on Twitter, I think earlier this week, um, and you guys expressed some concern over like, if right to repair it passes, will I fix it be be out of the job? And like, what'll happen? And really when <laughs> if, when right to repair passes, there'll just be more parts and more of these resources and things to, to go around. Cause um, there are so many things that need to be fixed that, you know, I fix it and private repair shops, those micro solders that you went to for, for your phone, like we're always going to need them. And I feel like there'll never be enough, you know, like. 
I don't think so. There's also, I mean, there are real limits to the manufacturer information, right? So yeah. even if if we we get manufacturer provided service manuals and schematics, that takes you so far. I mean, I, I remember uh, trying to change out the light bulb. I have a Honda uh, Civic, <laughs> and I, I I was in the manual. I got to the point where where you know it said you know remove this bolt and then you can remove the headlight assembly, and I couldn't. The bolt was corroded. And it turns out every Honda Civic that is 20 years old, this one bolt corrodes, and so then you have to go and remove the entire thing. And I, I was following through the instructions on that. And then it got to step seven, which was remove the front bumper. It's like, oh no, this is not a Sunday night at 9 p.m. Where is this going? <laughs> and oh and that's the kind of thing that, that if that manual had had an opportunity to evolve and improve, yeah. it would have been better. So I, don't, I, I think that some of the technology that, that I fix it provides being a wiki, something that evolves, something where, where we can have uh, expert members of the community like you guys join in and, and improve things that I don't think it will make a fix obsolete, but if it does and all the manufacturers step up and have fantastic repair information, Hey, the world's we probably win. better. And, <laughs> and if we're not needed, I am fine to you know, <laughs> go solve some other problem. So I wanted that we've got um, one of the parents here, Mark, uh, Mark with um, I've, it's interesting seeing like some parents that kind of respond to kid fixers in like really positive way. You, you're obviously one of them that like help support your son on this mission and his business and things. But then we've also got a lot of parents and a lot of people I think that are just like afraid of technology that are like afraid of their kids doing these things. It kind of goes back to like the safety issue that always gets brought sure. up with state reps. But Mark, how have you like supported Moses and what, if we want more fixers, the next generation of people to be fixers, I just kind of want some advice for parents on like, what if your kid comes to you and says, look, I opened up this phone, you know, instead of saying, you know, here's a kitten, can we keep it? Like, how do you uh, get yeah. the, uh, get those uh, creative or the, you know, right to repair Jesus flying in a sense? Yeah, well, I, um, I'm i super proud of Moses and both these guys. I mean, uh, the stuff that they do, my brain is not wired that way. I'm a photographer. I'm a creative. I spend a lot of my time mentoring people and helping to draw out of them what's in their hearts. And so taking a phone apart kind of freaks me out. Um, but so I, we saw this um, passion in Moses. And so what we really wanted to do was just kind of create space um, for him to be able to just do what he loved to do. So I was way more nervous than he was when he opened up that first um, <laughs> laptop screen and the first phone screen. He had a client recently who was getting a battery replacement, I think, or maybe something with the screen and the guy came upstairs in Moses workshop and was just kind of looking over his shoulder, which I wouldn't probably give that access. <laughs> but um, so I think what I'm trying to say is just to kind of create space, find out things that your kids are passionate about and then give them room to make mistakes. Like when, when that um, home button busted, I could tell in his voice, Moses was like, dad, can you come here? <laughs> And I was like, oh, this doesn't sound good. So um, there's been a few of those times, sometimes where um, he gets to um, cover the cost of something. And there's been other times where my wife and I will step in and say, hey, we're going to cover this. Um, we're entrepreneurs. so We know what it's like. There's no way to do this perfectly. Um, so yeah. I think given the freedom to make mistakes is a big, uh, big part of it, too. And I think repair techs, you know, these things happen every day. I mean, no matter how careful you're being, sometimes you, you know, cut that home button cable or, you know, these things kind of happen when you're starting your own business. Like, yeah, that can be definitely scary. Surya, what did your parents think when you were starting your first repair business? Were they super supportive or were they kind of nervous? Um, how did they feel about you fixing other people's devices as a business? Yeah, of course. So uh, for my first repair, my first like $20 screen or so, my mom gave me the twenty dollars as you call like seed money, and I managed to get enough phones repaired. I think around twenty phones for me to be able to cover the cost of one phone, and that happened once when I uh, I fixed a, I fixed a phone, and then I didn't put the penalty screws in, and then uh, my dog knock came and knocked 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 my phone off the table, and it cracked everything again. Um, but this time it was a lot worse than just the screen. It was like the logic board connectors and the the FP. Uh, the front panel connectors were all busted, so I had to uh, I had to buy a new phone then. Um, other than that, um, they've just basically left all like the financial stuff to me. If if they need, if they want to, if I need extra money, they'll pitch in. But mostly for them, it's maintaining a balance between my education and my business, and then yeah. leaving the rest up to me. 
Yeah, I started I fix it when I was a, a freshman and balancing figuring out how to balance your work life and and school is is challenging because you'll have a customer that's waiting on you and you need to do homework. You're like, which do I do? Did you get in trouble at Cal Poly for renting the business out of the dorm? It was technically, just, yeah, we started in the dorms uh, and yeah, it was technically against the the, the housing contract they made a okay. sign. You weren't supposed to run the business out of your dorm, but I've never heard of anyone enforcing that. I was like, it's a perfect incubator. I don't know. For, for business. It's crazy. I'm curious if you get, if, if you think back, Surya, to, to your, kind of the first time you tried taking things apart, I, oftentimes parents are concerned, or their kid gets a screwdriver and they start taking apart the toaster and then they get panicked and they say, don't do that. Do you have a memory like that? So I actually have more of this memory with my grandparents um, because they live in India. They have the 220 volt, which is a lot higher power and a lot more dangerous than here and um when i was in fifth grade they bought me one of those mechano sets it's like um metal metal screws and bolts it's like legos but with metal and once they seen once they saw me kind of venture towards the plug point with my screwdriver and they got super they got super scared and then they took the toy away from me um but other than that um my my dad has been pretty supportive um he's kind of He's he he's a surgeon, so he's 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 very good with his hands. And sometimes if I need help finding like a small screw or something, he'll come and help. But he's very good. Yeah, it's it's amazing that that practice uh, that that you have uh, when when you do that that kind of thing professionally. We have we have seen this over and over. There seems to be a cultural challenge where parents are always telling their kids don't take that thing apart and i think it's part of like you know don't run out into the street yeah. just parents being protective but they're almost overly protective i've run events at schools and we'll say hey do you want to take apart an ipod and the kids are terrified because every adult in their life up until that point has said don't take that thing apart yeah and i'm surprised when i go into schools by how many just students don't even know how to like push down with a screwdriver so don't even know how to use it because yeah that was the toolbox that you're not supposed to touch and you know mommy and daddy will fix it it's too dangerous but um is that something something that you guys see with your your classmates moses Do do you see kind of a fear of opening things yeah i mean none of my classmates really have any desire to fix anything i don't think or i don't know they're i think they're just too afraid, I guess. I'm not sure. Why do you like fixing things? Like, why do you, I don't know, like doing, like doing um, these for a project? Because it's fun. I get to have fun while doing it. I'm not sure why I think it's fun, but I do. And then also it, like, saves money, and I get to make new things. Nice. So, yeah, what do you enjoy the most? Can you repeat the question one more time? What do you enjoy the most about fixing things? I honestly find it really relaxing. I don't know why, um, but I know like the, the torque of the screw, I finally go into its place or unscrewing stuff is super relaxing to me. Um, at a point in seventh grade, I think, I started taking apart so many things. I have a bin back there with a bunch of circuit boards from everything. And um, I there's probably been a time where my dad's looked for a remote and can't find it because I've taken the IR LEDs out of it. So um, I like taking stuff apart a lot. It's just super therapeutic sometimes. That's great. So as you think about the arc of history, you know, like my grandparents in the 1930s, everybody had to repair everything. There was this make do and mend mentality. You had World War II and, you know, we were really resource constrained. And so, so anything that people had was, was really precious. There, there's this kind of general perception that, uh, you know, we don't fix things the way that we used to, that, that repair doesn't make as much sense anymore. Um, what do you think your generation's uh, relationship is with things compared to, say, my generation? Uh, and Surya, take it away. Yeah, so definitely. Um, I grew up on a VCR, and I remember the, um, the hardware store is selling like, the vacuum tubes and the, the, the little the parts you can repair your own stuff with. And over time, I've definitely seen people, I've definitely seen companies go from more open to closed electronics and kind of using technologies to advance for you to kind of um, rationalize their decision to close it out. Um, But my friends and stuff, in like second or third grade, um, I had a few of my buddies, we like to take apart a bunch of stuff. But over time, we noticed that some of our friends um, were given iPhones, were given phones, and because of the expense, how much that product cost, uh, they didn't want to take risks with it. 
and this is kind of along the time when the city uh, jailbreaking stuff was out. People didn't want to take risks with that stuff. Not that saying that that stuff is good or not, but uh, people started over time to become um, more concerned with keeping their vice intact, keeping um, their product, uh, making sure they don't break it, instead of learning more about what product they have and how that product works. Yeah. And so, yeah, I was trying to message you. If you could turn your mic a little closer to you so we can hear you a little louder, that'd be, that'd be awesome. But um, I think the, yeah, the value that we place on the things that we own, I think, you know, our grandparents' generation, you know, buying that first car or making some of these purchases were just so insanely difficult for them that like, you know, there was, they wanted to invest in their stuff. And I think because our, you know, disposable kind of society and plant right. obsolescence and things have just made well, I just, I think it's just, it's easy for people to get something new. And so that's the, like that culture. Well, so I like, think that's true. But on the other hand, you guys are the first generation that has been given something very expensive at a relatively young age. Yeah, uh, for sad. us, it was a car. Like when you, maybe when you turned 16, it was legal to drive. Maybe you were going to get a car and certainly, you know, you would be uh, paying to fix it if, if, if you did anything to it. Uh, Moses, how do you think seeing all your friends with these expensive phones, you know, 10 years ago, kids didn't have a, a device in their pocket that was worth $400. Yeah. So, I mean, I think a lot of people are irresponsible sometimes. Um, they like drop them and feel like people need to put screen protectors on more. But, um, but I feel like a lot of people just want the newest thing. And a lot of my friends will just get the newest thing. And yeah. I feel like they don't want it to get it repaired. They just want the newest device. So why don't you want the newest thing? Does it, you know, the iPhone 8 versus the iPhone 10, you know, is it just not the big of a difference? Do you just like holding on to your stuff? Like, why don't you want the next best thing? Um, it's mainly just like how expensive it is and like how I can get similar devices for a lot cheaper by fixing them. Yeah. yeah, makes sense to me. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. This has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, it's I think it's really interesting to see, uh, you know, how, you know, as as we, you know, the, the facts on the ground have changed. Right, people are, are kids have access to more and more advanced technology at a younger age, uh, and yet I think I think the 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 fundamentals of whether you're you're tinkering with uh, transistor radio in the 80s or an Atari 2600. Uh, for me, it was the early Macs in the, in the early 90s, and you guys are are working with with the modern smartphones. Kids are always going to be pushing the envelope of, of working with and breaking and fixing the Oh, technology. I can't open this? I'm going to try to open it. <laughs> so th thank you guys so much for joining us and, and for taking some time away from school. Really appreciate it. Yeah, and we so the yeah, the I'm a Genius campaign um, is still going on all through uh, the end of the month. And if you uh, share your repair story with hashtag I'm a Genius, um, you can take a look at Moses and Surya's submissions. Um, I've got a link in the description and just by following us on Twitter. And if you share your own video um, to to the campaign, we're going to pick um, 10 people to get a $100 gift cards to the iFixit store. So you could be one of the people to win that. So again, we've, the I'm a Genius has just been awesome. We've seen so many amazing videos um, from these two as well. And we'd love to hear more about your repair stories and why repair is important to you in your life. So um, feel free to yeah share another one with us and we'll be back here uh, next Thursday for, and we'll be bringing on some more um, right to repair advocates and talking a little bit more how you can get involved at the state level. But um, yeah, thanks again for being here, everybody. Yeah. Thanks for having us on. Absolutely. We'll see you guys later. Yeah. What is some of the other uh, news that's been going on? We have. Uh, yeah, well, full, um, we, at the end, we're talking about all the different types of phones and things they, they use, but the um, Samsung folding phones. And I wish, I, I don't know if they um, had a chance to look at it, but I'd be curious to see what they think. You guys are welcome to hop off. We will, we will catch you uh, next time. Thanks, guys. So uh, some of the other news that I've seen is, uh, yeah, so I mean, people have been asking me with the Huawei phones, yep. wh what do we think about the new Huawei OLED and the uh, 
and, and the Samsung phones. And I think it I think it's a pretty cool, pretty cool gizmo. Yeah. It reminds me of like Star Trek and you had like the foldable tablet, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and you fold it and put it in your pocket. I think that's kind of the, the vision that everybody has with with a tablet is how do we get uh how do we get to something that is basically paper? And yeah. these gizmos are not quite there. I mean, they just, I don't know. I, I, I'm just always, I feel like everybody's opening and closing them, constantly using them and having like another hinge there is just like another point of failure. And how do we um, I just, I don't, I don't see them as phones that would last for me, but maybe I just got to stop like shoving things in my back pocket. And maybe doing this. Well, and the OLED technology is, is, is so new. I, I was talking at CES with some of the LG folks where they have the rollable TVs. And I said, well, how many times can it go up and down? And they said like 200,000 times. And I'm thinking that ah, maybe, yeah. but certainly have it in your pocket. It's that folding radius yeah. where it's going to be pinching. And if you look at it in, in the, the photos, you get this kind of crinkly plasticky look right at the, at the where, yeah. where it rounds around and I, I, I don't think I think it's gonna I think they're very expensive right they're eighteen hundred dollars for the Samsung one yeah and, and twenty five hundred over twenty five hundred for the Huawei yeah and go back to what Surya and um, Moses were saying just about the price of these things and it's like well I already have a laptop and maybe I already have a tablet at home and my phone so like do I just combine everything into one and just you know get that one I yeah I don't know that if I necessarily have have the need there but what are the comments we're getting some uh awesome comments on repairing a folding phone screen sounds extremely difficult and very expensive. I think so. I mean, pretty much the screen is the device at that point. And the question is, how do you separate it? I mean, we have certainly, I, I was thinking the closest analogy that we have is the Galaxy Edge phones right now, yeah. where we generally give the Galaxy Edge devices a lower, like a one point lower score than, yeah. so an S9 Edge uh, scores lower. And the reason is that that screen is it folds around, it makes it harder to open it. Uh, and and it's also just a much more expensive commode to manufacture. It's been really hard for, as, you know, I mean, justifiably so, as the manufacturers push the envelope with technology, it's been harder for aftermarket companies to catch up. And we've seen this, like, if you if you have an iPhone 10 with no LED screen and you break it, there are aftermarket LEDs that can go into your iPhone 10 that maybe won't be quite as good as your original screen, mm -hmm. but they're dramatically cheaper than an OLED part. I'm, I just want to... I want to do a teardown of one and see like what does this repair process look like or especially motorola's even got another you know the new razor that's coming out that is rumored to have you know full it's still a folding phone but folds open into one flat screen in oh, the middle and it's just like and that's going to be an oled flexible I, I guess and so i just wonder i don't know changing the shape of these teardowns or either usually opening something from the front or you know in the back and right. taking it apart but this is kind of a whole nother monster there you go for a design and <laughs> an effective design in a sense well, it's also going to be interesting as they're coming out with these products, how are they going to comply? Like, we're going to get right to repair legislation passed, right? Yeah. We're, we're very optimistic. Things are going well. How, how are they going to comply? What Are they starting to build out these part supply chains? So if you, and if you build a, so what what's going to happen with these manufacturers that are building devices that, you know, can't be repaired and right to repair comes out, they're going to be asked to provide parts. But yeah, what if this device, like you literally like the, um, you know, essential phone, we you know, froze it to break it together. Right. You know, this this is a philosophical question where, are you, and, and, Right to repair has not gone to the point where it's saying really that you have to make design changes. No. With the one notable exception, the Washington right to repair bill says that it, it actually makes it illegal for manufacturers to glue batteries into phones. So that's really interesting because that's the first time we've seen a jurisdiction say there is a design that, that we don't want to see. The reference legislation from repair.org doesn't say anything about the mm -hmm. device design. And so you can circumvent right to repair by gluing something together and making it so that no one can fix it. And that's effectively what mm -hmm. the AirPods are, right? So the, the AirPods are unrepairable, unrecyclable. They're they're completely glued together. Apple uh, has a battery service for their hundred and uh, yeah, <laughs> it's it's a hundred dollars for a battery service for one of your earbuds or at, what, what do AirPods cost? Are they one hundred and seventy nine dollars? Yeah, yeah, so it it doesn't even really make sense. Uh, that may be right to repair two point oh. Uh, yeah. we, we've seen some interest from Europe in regulating device design a little bit. And and so I think you may see. In regulating design, does it mean, you know, stopping progress with technology? It's just about doing it responsibly. Because, I mean, I think, I, I always say this, manufacturers have like a responsibility to develop. And when they're selling a product, it needs to last. And so that means it needs to be repairable. And, and I think you can have repairable design and progressive design at the same time. I think 
you know, one of the kickbacks we get is like, oh, this is going to stop innovation. And it's like, in what world? It would, innovate. Right now, like, please oh. innovate in the space of repair. Yeah, please innovate in a way that's not going to kill the planet and all of our resources and these things. And yeah, right. I, I get the opportunity to work with industrial designers a lot and we, we talk with them and they talk about how they have design constraints. They're given objectives from the business. We want it to be this thick. We want the battery life to be this. We want the performance to be this. And if they're given repairability objectives, these designers are very smart people. They were very mm -hmm. capable of making these things repairable and accomplishing some of the other objectives. Yeah. There, there may be some trade-offs that you're going to make, but we, I mean, as we work on our, our teardowns, we work on repairability reports, mm -hmm. right? We get the chance to talk with, with the product designers and, and a lot of them say, look, we really would like to be able to prioritize repairability. We need assistance from the business. We need assistance from marketing and management to decide to make it a priority. Yeah. And, but I think that's where, you know, our teardowns and our repair, the repairability assessments come in. Um, and to have that, di I, I think it'd be nice just to have more of an open dialogue with that. But I think manufacturers are scared right. to talk to us. Well, that, that's going to come down to consumers, right? Having the conversation, yeah. it comes down to gadget reviewers. Like where is, uh, right, the, the yeah. Verge or, or Wire Cutter or some of these you know, industry leading news organizations should be uh, making repairability a priority in their reviews. And that was, we had the, the review of the sneakers, the, uh, the self tying okay. sneakers. <laughs> yeah. And, and one of the things she mentioned is, Hey, you've got, you're putting batteries in these sneakers. The battery is going to wear out maybe before the sneakers do. What's the plan here? Yeah. And even, you know, wrote a blog on IBO, which is, you know, they're required to provide parts and things for seven years, but yeah, like what's, um, how, like, in these reviews, they often say, okay, battery life is this long. You'll get this much screen time out of it. But it's like, but what's your investment <laughs> looking like? Right. Is this a one, a two year investment? Or, you know, it's just, but, but especially didn't, when everything's really expensive. Didn't Sony with the IBO, they said that they were going to support it for seven years? Yeah. So that's with the most recent iteration of IBO. They'll have parts available for seven years. Now, your warranty is only, I think it has like a three, they have like an extended three year warranty. So they offer. Um, updates right. and other things, but you have to pay into that too. So maybe there's like limited but, but warranty. That's, but they're thinking about it, yeah. right? They, and and I think they learned from the first Ibo that that if you're going to sell people a robot dog, they will get emotionally attached to it, yeah. <laughs> and that longevity of your pet maybe matters. Yeah. Yeah. And that becomes a uh, part of the product value proposition, right? That's part of what you're selling is, hey, this this robot dog is so good that you're going to yeah. demand that we you know make a repair option available for you in and four years. I feel similarly about my laptop. Like you know, I mean, and then. And to talk about like brand dedication. Like if you can tell somebody that we know that this is an investment for you and we're going to continue to support it or, you know, with Ibo, we want you to be in love with this robot dog for a long time. That builds right. like brand dedication. And I think, I don't know that that would, I would love to hear that more from manufacturers. Of, like we want you to keep this for a long time and like, you know, use it to death. I don't, I know I got this laptop from, I fix it, but I don't want to keep it up. <laughs> so this is an interesting <laughs> example where this particular product, we both have the 2012 MacBook Pro and it has a design flaw. Um, that where there is a hard drive cable on the bottom. So if I, if I mm. grab your laptop right on, on the bottom here, uh, where the hard drive, basically the bottom case is aluminum is as it flexes, it rubs against that cable. And uh, so pretty much every, every one of these MacBook Pros that's been out in the world for, for more than you know, four or five years, eventually you're, you get the blinky question mark on boot up. Well, it's a, it's a design flaw. They should have put some shielding on the cable. Uh, but it actually ends up not being that bad, right? Yeah. Because it is so easy to open up the case. You get 10 screws on the bottom and you can swap out the cable. That repair takes less than 10 minutes and it's like a $20 cable. Uh, where let's compare that to, uh, let's compare that to the current, you know, the 2015 and newer MacBook Pros where in the display hinge, they, they have the same kind of flex cable, right? And every time you open and close the display, uh, it flexes that cable and that, that cable has a limited design life. That also is a design flaw. The difference is that they glued the, the display shut in such a way that you really cannot change that cable. And so either you have to do something like what Moses did, where you take it to a micro solder and they actually fix that individual plugs cable, or you have to replace the, the display assembly, which is a part that cannot be made by the aftermarket because the Apple logo is on the back here, right? <laughs> and then be careful or else those are uh, not... Uh... Yeah, those parts, they'll probably take those parts from you at some point, maybe. So I, I think this is an interesting discussion where, where uh, you know, to some extent, repairability helps shield manufacturers and consumers from kind of inevitable design errors. Yeah. And, and that's that's something that, that you know, it, it, another major mistake back in the day was the Xbox 360 had this red ring of death problem. Yeah. Uh, where 
almost every Xbox out there ended up uh, failing because because the the GPU would overheat and it would it would crack the solder. Well, the, the Xbox it was repairable and you could open it up, but it took a while. And I think that has definitely informed like the cost that Microsoft had to expend taking all those in under warranty, disassembling them all, putting them back together uh, was really. I mean, they were they had a billion dollar write down over it. And and I think they're saying, man, if we had designed that to be just a little bit faster to open up, yeah. Well, it would have cost them a lot less. I wonder what Apple's thinking about the battery gate thing. I'm like, well, maybe if we just, you know, offered battery replacements a little bit sooner, <laughs> you know, like less people would have, you know, freaked out about the throttling thing. More right. people, their phones would have been, and people wouldn't have been forced to. Or you know, maybe as them. Apple stores are so impacted, like you try to get an appointment in an Apple store and it's weeks out, it's really yeah. hard. So if they could design the phone to make the battery faster to swap, it would be interesting. Yeah. And we see they're trying to do this with the newest iPads, right? Yeah. We had They had some of the pull, tab. the pull tabs. Yeah, we see some of those design changes. I feel like more from Apple and in their products than we do in Samsung products. I think a lot of people will um, point out that we, we talk about Apple a lot because we're at opposite ends with them within the right to repair and they're really advocating pretty hard against us. But Samsung, like I would rather open up and swap a screen on an iPhone or Absolutely. repair a battery than a Samsung. It's just like, it makes me cringe. The iPhone, that if you look at all of the smartphones on the market right now, the iPhone is at the top, and it's because Apple's engineers are designing repairability into the process, specifically repair of the screen and the yeah. battery, right, is what they're focused on. But that absolutely is something that you can really see in the design language of the internals of that phone, where Samsung clearly is not putting the yeah. same priority. And, and you know, shame on Google right now. The Pixels used to be pretty repairable, and they've gotten steadily worse. Because you, you used to have a Pixel. I used to have a Pixel, and I, I switched. I, I'm now... Um, I'm now rocking. I have a. I've got a Moto X4, which is which is pretty great and also a pretty repairable device. We've covered a lot today. I mean, it was just cool to hear from stories from Moses and Surya, and just just another example of how like how repair is for everybody. And um, yeah, the right to repair campaign is going to keep going through. So we'll be seeing a bunch of videos. How has it been for you to see all these videos and to like hear from everybody in the campaign? It's just been really inspiring to see the the diversity of, of backgrounds that people are coming yeah. at this with, right? Where you have uh, people that have no technical expertise to people that, that are professionals that have all learned how to do this through teaching each other. It's not just I fix it, right? It's YouTube. It's the repair community. It's everybody is teaching each other. And it really takes that momentum uh, yeah. to build enough of a community to to start to achieve change. Yeah. And we've got, um, I, we didn't bring it up earlier, but um, Surya did a great job starting a petition for Michigan. And I'll put it in the show notes. So if you want to um, sign on to that, I think it's got like almost 700 signatures now and it's doing That's really so well. Cool. Um, so we'll put that in the description also with repair.org and repair.org slash sign dash up to um, easily write into your state reps. And um, how can we learn about where's Moses at? So Moses also has mosesbuckwalter.com, his repair website. And I, suggest you guys check it out like his um they do a great job with photos and just documenting repair with and the videos and everything on their site are really inspiring and um so that's why i'm happy to have them on so we'll put all those links um they they might already be in the this description but they'll definitely be in the show notes for the podcast folks and uh yeah don't forget to share your videos for i'm a genius and we're going to be putting all of those together into two compilation videos on our channel so you'll actually be able to see um all of our favorite submissions and everything there and um yeah it's really important to show the world that we can fix all these things so Definitely share your stories with us. The legislative season is in full swing right now. So we had uh, we had hearings in Washington on right to repair. We we got voted out of committee in Washington, which is fantastic. We're anticipating we will see bills being introduced uh, in in some more states coming up soon. Um, so now is the time to to get write your legislator and get involved. Uh, every every state legislature in the country is active right now and, and working on on this issue, uh, and. Uh, I can, I actually, I have here, I can pull up a map. This is, these are all the states that have right to repair bills active right now. Uh, so you can see, I mean, the entire Western uh, uh, coast, including Hawaii is on board. It's got a good arc coming yeah. to the top. And <laughs> Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, Missouri, Illinois, uh, Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia, uh, New Jersey, New York, yeah. New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Georgia. Ooh. We had a great uh, group of professional repair shops in Georgia, uh, on uh, on Tuesday, where they they went down to the state capitol and they they walked around and, and there was a great showing of a lot of professional repairers from across the state came into came into town. So it was really really cool to see all the professional or the pros that submitted videos for I'm a genius too. They, they were phenomenal and did a really great job. Um, I know 
and I was just looking at Florida there and I'm like, we need to get something going to Florida. And I repair fast is an awesome, you know, great channel. We just started working with, they do lots of repair and liquid cooling and all that kind of stuff, but um, they've been great advocates and their video you know, about right to repair was awesome. So um, there you go. Yeah. And Florida is a Republican controlled legislator, okay. le legislature. So reach out to your elected Republicans. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you have the opportunity, I mean, talk with your local rep, no matter what, but if you can look and see which party is in power and talk with a rep that is in the party that is in power, you're going to have more success. Us yeah. on average because than, than if you talk to someone in the minority. Right to repair is a bipartisan issue. Everybody needs to be able to fix their stuff and it breaks. So yeah, right. it doesn't matter which side you're on, go talk to people because your repair yeah. story is going to resonate this with This is a like, common is... sense political issue, right? But yeah. Representatives on both sides want, want to represent consumers. Representatives on both sides want more local small businesses. They want to see more technology in classrooms. Uh, yeah, everybody wants a, a clean environment and to, and to leave uh, right a a, you know, a a planet for our kids. So yeah. I, this is this is really common sense across the political spectrum. The only people who are against right to repair are the lawyers at these big mega corporations. Yeah. Everyone else in the board and everyone else in the wor world is uh, is on our side. Yeah. So uh, this is just a matter of overcoming that entrenched money in politics. Yeah, and just banding together, have uh, more people than they do at a lot of the hearings and things like that too. So that's great. Well, cover a lot. And yeah. we'll have more um, on next Thursday. So feel free to keep you know the chat going with some more questions and things about today, if there's any other resources that you want us to, to share. And we'll see, the, see you all in a couple of weeks. Thanks again for everybody for being on. That's a wrap. Bye.